This study in the New Testament book of John is offered for the edification of all students of God's Word by spiritandtruth.org. Pastor Andy Woods of Sugarland Bible Church will be our instructor during this study. It is our prayer that this study will deepen your understanding of the Bible and allow you to draw closer in your relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. John 17.3 Now let's begin our time of study in this important and fascinating book of the Bible. Good morning. If we could open our Bibles to John chapter 4 and verse 1. Trusting everybody had a wonderful and bountiful Thanksgiving. Now that we're all about five pounds heavier and too intimidated to get on the scale. But it was a great, great time. John chapter 4, verse 1. If time permits, we're going to try to cover verses 1 through 9 this morning. The title of our message this morning is Three Strikes and You Are Not Out. Three Strikes and You're Not Out. And of course, if you've been with us, uh, we've been moving through John's Gospel John's Gospel is really about the light and the life revealed in the person of Christ. And uh, we spent a little bit of time talking about the background of the book, but many, really the main thing to understand is John's purpose statement. John is nice to us and gives us his purpose in writing. In John 20, verses 30 and 31, It says, therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you might believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John, what are we supposed to get out of this book? You're supposed to understand that Jesus is the Son of God, and then that you're supposed to trust in him and consequently receive the gift of life. Everything John weaves into his book through the inspiration of the Spirit is designed to accomplish that purpose and that goal. We spent some time in John 1, which is really a record of where Christ came from, tracing Christ back to heaven, his origin and his ultimate destination. And then from there we moved into the second major section of John's Gospel, which is his largest section. It's Christ's public ministry revolving around his seven signs and seven discourses. And we're inching our way through that section. Here's the ground we've covered so far. We've had a presentation of the Son of God at the end of chapter 1. And then we had Christ's first miracle, water to wine at Cana. And then from there, we saw Christ cleansing the temple, and that led to some questions about his ministry, so that led into John 3, which is his long conversation with a man named Nicodemus regarding how to be born spiritually. And then the focus shifted, as we saw last week, to a man named John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ. And John very clearly explains at the end of John 3 that his purpose is not to eclipse the Son of God, but is to decrease so that Christ might increase. And in that section, he clearly reveals the identity of this individual, the God-man, Jesus Christ. And now we leave chapter 3 and move into chapter 4. And many people are familiar with John chapter 4. It is the story of the woman at the well. It goes uh, from John chapter 4, verse 1, all the way through verse 42. And then once you get to verse 43, to the end of the chapter, we'll get a 
discussion of Christ's second sign. But we will save that for another Sunday. Right now we're focused on this conversation that he has with this woman at the well. It takes place, as Ed read the verses this morning, at a place called Sychar. And so here's an outline we can use to outline this unit. We have the Savior, hope you like the letter S, by the way. The Savior sojourns to Sychar, verses 1 through 6. Then we have the Savior speaks to a sinner at Sychar, verses 7 through 27. And that's where Jesus has a long conversation with this woman at the well. And then part three, verses 28 through 42, the sinner at Sychar becomes a soul winner. She is tremendously impacted by what Jesus has told her. And she believes in Jesus Christ and she wants everybody to hear the message of Jesus Christ. And so she becomes a phenomenal evangelist at the end of this section. Now, this morning, we will probably make it through the first section, maybe a tad into the second section. So what we're focusing on this morning is the Savior sojourning or traveling to a place called Sychar. And we can break down verses 1 through 6 this way. The Savior leaves Judea, verses 1 through 3, and then he will arrive in Samaria, Verses 4 through 6. Now, you're looking at this and you're saying this is just boring geography. Not so. Hopefully, as God allows me, under the power of the Spirit, these verses will jump right off the page to you and you will see how tremendously relevant they are to 21st century life. But notice, first of all, the Savior leaves Judea. Notice, if you will, there, John chapter 4 and verse 1. It says, Therefore, when the Lord knew the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, dropping down to verse 3, he left Judea and went away again into Galilee. There was a problem that occurred back in Judea. You might recall where Judea is. It's the surrounding area surrounding the city of Jerusalem. If you want to know where Jerusalem is, you just go to the top of the Dead Sea and take a sharp left, and you'll run into Jerusalem. And that area surrounding the city of Jerusalem is this area called Judea. That's where Christ was baptizing. John the Baptist was baptizing further north, but there was a rivalry, you'll recall, that broke out between John and some of his disciples, complaining that Christ's ministry was growing. Christ was becoming more popular than John. And that's where we saw last week John saying, that's okay, don't let that bother you, this is how things are supposed to work, because Jesus is unique, he is the God-man. His ministry should eclipse my own. But Jesus had been baptizing in Judea. He was very prosperous in terms of ministry success. And Jesus did not want the Pharisees, you'll see a reference to the Pharisees in chapter 4 and verse 1. He did not want the Pharisees, the enemies, the opponents, the legalists, the ones that would rush Christ to the cross to be killed. He didn't want that crowd to yet become aware of his ministry. And had he stayed in Judea, his popularity would have continued to grow. You see, the confrontation between Jesus Christ and the Pharisees, there was a time schedule in as to when that was supposed to occur. And the time was not yet. And what we have to understand about Jesus Christ, the God-man, is he lived his life on an exact divine time schedule. John chapter 2 and verse 4, he says, my hour has not come. John 7 and verse 6, he says, my time is not yet. John 7 and verse 8, he says, my time has not fully come. John 7 and verse 30 says, because his hour had not yet come. You see, this contest, this confrontation between Jesus and the Pharisees would take place. It just had not occurred yet 
in terms of the chronology of God. It wasn't time for those things to happen. And this is one of the things we need to understand about our lives. We have a very difficult time understanding the timetable of God. We want things right away. If God has put some sort of desire on our heart, we want it to materialize instantaneously. And if it doesn't materialize instantaneously, we have a tendency to think that we're outside of God's will. But the longer you walk with God, the more you begin to see that timing is critical. God is not running your life as a Christian on your schedule. He is running it on his schedule. There are many things that I've wanted in my life, and had I received those things early beyond the appointed time, they would not have had the effect that they are supposed to have. Many times God is waiting for us to grow to a place of greater maturity so he can usher us into higher things and greater things. God is very, very busy in our lives, even during those times where we think he has forgotten us. And so if God has put a desire on your heart, whether it be a desire for a ministry, a desire to do something in the business world, a desire to have children, whatever the case may be, and that desire is not immediately fulfilled, don't despair, because oftentimes what you'll discover is God will fulfill that desire, but he will do it in accordance with his schedule and his timetable, not our own. It wasn't time yet for Jesus to be in a contest with the Pharisees. And so consequently, Jesus leaves Judea. And notice, if you will, verse 2. It says this. It's a little parenthetical statement, and it's easy to just sort of brush over things like this. But I think it gives us an indication as to why it wasn't time yet for the final phases of his ministry to be executed. Verse 2 says, Although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were baptizing. And what is happening is Jesus Christ is allowing his disciples to play a greater and greater role in his ministry. He is giving them, in essence, ministry experience. And one of the reasons it was not time yet is because I believe the Lord is working in the maturity of these disciples, giving them more opportunities, letting them do more and more and more in the ministry of Jesus Christ to mature them and to prepare them for what is yet to come. Because these individuals would become, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20, the disciples would become the foundations of the church. And most, if not all of them, would die horrific deaths to glorify Christ. Now, they were not ready for that responsibility. They were not ready for that role. Uh, They needed more time of preparation. They needed more time of ministry opportunity. And it wasn't yet time for the Pharisees to come into an open contest with this man, Jesus Christ. The Lord is working According to a schedule, and he is bringing his disciples to a place of maturity. And by the way, one of the things that God has entrusted to us at Sugarland Bible Church is the lives of many people that are seeking some sort of role in ministry. Uh, I teach at a Bible college. Some of the students that uh, are familiar with my ministry at the Bible college come to this church, and they're faithful attenders, and in some cases members of this church. And one of the things that we think about constantly is how can we give these people more opportunities to do more things? Because you really can't grow and develop as a spiritual leader unless somebody gives you an opportunity to do something significant. So don't be surprised if one of these days somebody, uh, not myself, comes and leads communion. Don't be surprised if an unfamiliar face teaches a Sunday school class. These are things that we want to inculcate because we see our role at Sugarland Bible Church is to prepare people for ministries that God would have for them. One of the most uh, fascinating things happened in my life, I was very young, I was about age 22, is the pastor of the church gave me an opportunity to teach a Sunday school class. 
I had been teaching on the end times. I was 22 years old. I was, had read Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth, so I was obviously an expert in the subject, right? And this pastor took a gamble on me. He basically allowed me to exercise a gift that I felt God had given me on a larger basis. And uh, that that group that I was teaching originally was a small group. And once the pastor opened the door, suddenly on a Sunday night, the whole church showed up. And it scared the absolute daylights out of me, to be honest with you. But you see, through that, the Lord began to show me that I had certain gifts in certain areas. And had that pastor not given me an opportunity to do something of significance for God, I don't know if I would have developed or grown spiritually to the point where I am today. And so I look back at that pastor who's now retired, and I look at him as playing a strategic role in my life. Because he gave me the opportunity to do something. He gave me the opportunity to fall flat on my face. And I've fallen (laughs) flat on my face many, many times. And so we need not fear failure. Uh, We just need to learn from failure and grow through failure. But if we're going to give people opportunities to do something, we have to give them an opportunity to mess things up. We will recover. Uh, We will get over it. Just don't let this mess up be too severe, of course. But um, that is how the Holy Spirit works. And we want the Sugarland Bible Church to be a church just like this. So Jesus is actually letting his disciples do the baptizing. And then as you move down to verse 3, it says this. He left Judea and went away to Galilee. To avoid this open confrontation with the Pharisees, he went to Judea, which is at the bottom of the map, and he traveled upward to Galilee, which is up there uh, in the north. And so that takes us to verses 4 through 6, where now the Savior is leaving Judea, and he is arriving or traveling at this place called Samaria. Samaria. Now you say, wait a minute, Samaria, I don't recall that being mentioned in verse 3. It's not mentioned in verse 3. But Samaria is the location that he will go to. He is going to leave Judea, bottom of the map, eventually make his way up into Galilee, top of the map, and right there in the middle of those two geographic locales is a place called Samaria, where he will encounter a woman at the well. Now, let me read to you a footnote from the Ryrie Study Bible. And, of course, the Ryrie Study Bible is the study Bible that all spirit-led believers use. And notice what it says there in verse 4, for those of you that have a Ryrie Study Bible. It says this, Normally, the Jewish people avoided Samaria by crossing to the east of the Jordan, to travel from Judea to Galilee. But Christ wanted to witness to those despised Samaritans. So there is a normal uh, trajectory, a normal path that you take as a Jew in the first century when you travel from Judea up into up north into Galilee. You basically move east... <coughs> And you cross the Jordan River. The Jordan River is that river that connects those two bodies of water, the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee. And then you move in a north, northward direction. And once you completely avoid Samaria, then you move back west and you go into Galilee. So the whole pathway that Jews took when they traveled between Judea and Galilee was designed to avoid this place called Samaria, where the woman at the well will be located. Now, we might ask ourselves the question, why did the Jews want to avoid this area called Samaria? The answer goes all the way back into your Old Testament, into 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 23 and 24. And basically what happened in 2 Kings 17, verses 23 and 24, is a king of Assyria by the name of tiglath Pileser, say that five times fast, uh, had come and he had dispersed the northern tribes. 
The northern prophets had warned that this dispersion would occur because of disobedience to the Mosaic Covenant. And so at that point in time, 2 Kings 17, the warnings of Amos and Hosea and other northern prophets began to be fulfilled. And tiglath pileser of Assyria in 722 B.C. displaced the northern tribes, kicked them out. They went into dispersion. And what tiglath pileser did is he brought in another group of people to fill the void into the land of Israel. These people were brought in from the region of Babylon. And this is what 2 Kings 17, verses 23 through 24 says. It says, Until the Lord removed Israel from his sight, as he spoke through all his servants, the prophets, so Israel was carried away into exile from their own land to Assyria until this day. The king of Assyria brought men from Babylon, and set, settled them in the cities of Samaria, in the place of the sons of Israel. So they possessed Samaria and lived in its cities. That's that middle region there between Judea and Galilee. Israel is kicked out, 722 B.C., because of Assyria. And so the king says, we're just going to fill that void with some Babylonians. And these Babylonians came in. And these Babylonians brought in to the land of Israel their pagan gods and their pagan deities. 2 Kings 17, verse 27 says this, They feared the Lord and served their own gods according to the customs of the nations from among whom they had been carried away into exile. 2 Kings 17 and uh, verse 27 Puts it this way, it says, The king of Assyria commanded, saying, Take there one of the priests whom you carried away into exile, and let him go and live there, and let them teach the customs of the God of the land. So the Jews are kicked out, the Babylonians are brought into Samaria. The Babylonians brought with them their pagan gods and their pagan deities. And just so the Jews uh, wouldn't feel too bad and the Assyrians didn't feel too bad about what had happened, they sent some Jewish priests into Samaria to at least teach a little bit of Judaism. And so what began to take place at Samaria was something called syncretizing where the gods of Babylonia were intermingled with the gods or the god of Israel. Now, the more you try to syncretize, the more you begin to see that the two systems don't go together. There are many attempts today by people to syncretize Christianity. One of the most outrageous things that I've discovered is something called Chrislam, where you sort of uh, meld the principles of Islam, with the principles of Christianity, and that is like trying to mix oil and water. And that, in essence, is what is happening in this place called Samaria. And the Jews, the Orthodox Jews, were so offended by this, they would not even let these Samarians participate in rebuilding the temple. When the Jews came back into the land of Israel and they began to rebuild the temple, which had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 B.C., and that temple began to be rebuilt about 515 B.C., the book of Ezra talks all about it. Um, The prophets Haggai and Zechariah are prophesying during that time. The The Samaritans came to Jerusalem and they said, we want to help. We want to contribute. We want to participate. And because Samaria had such a negative image, the Jews says you, the Jews said you cannot help with the rebuilding of this temple. And so as time progressed, what happened is these uh, Samaritans, those in Samaria, began to intermarry with Jews. And they created a half-breed race, partly uh, Jewish, and partly Babylonian, and these people were known for mixing Judaism and Babylonian religions together. In fact, they are individuals that really just followed their own program. They refused to go to Jerusalem over time to worship Yahweh. 
John 4 and verse 20 says this, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and yet you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. There were two mountains that were set up as Moses was commanding the children of Israel to enter the land all the way back into the book of Deuteronomy. There was one mountain called Mount Ebal. And there was another mountain called Mount Gerizim. The children of Israel were under the Mosaic Covenant, which mandated blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. And Moses never wanted the children of Israel to forget about the blessings and the curses of the Mosaic Covenant. So what he said to the children of Israel that were about to enter the land... You recall Moses himself did not enter the land, but the children of Israel did. Is he says, you're going to go into the land, you're going to see two mountains. One is called Ebal. And I want you to take half of the tribes up to Ebal, and I want you to recite the curses of the Mosaic Covenant. These are curses that God would bring upon Israel for disobeying the Mosaic Covenant. And then Moses says, I want you to take the other half of the tribes, and I want you to take them up to Gerizim, and I want you to cite there the blessings of the Mosaic Covenant. In other words, these are the good things that will happen if you follow the Mosaic Covenant. And this is all spelled out very clearly in Deuteronomy 27, verses 12 and 13. This is the words of Moses to the generation that's about to enter the land. And it says, When you cross the Jordan, these shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people. And it names half the tribes, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. And then Deuteronomy 27, verse 13 says, For the curse... These shall stand on Mount Ebal, and then he names half the tribes, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And so Gerizim, not Ebal, but Gerizim became known as the mountain of blessing. And that is in essence where the Samaritans set up shop religiously. They would not go to Jerusalem. They were a half-breed race, partly Jew, partly Babylonian. They were syncretizers. They were individuals that would not follow the game plan. They would not go to Jerusalem to worship. They instead would go to Gerizim, the mountain of blessing, to worship the Lord. They were sort of the Frank Sinatra approach to religion. I did it my way. They wanted to carve their own path. They wanted to do things their own way. And consequently, that group called the Samaritans were intensely hated by the Jews. John chapter 4 and verse 9 says this, Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you being a Jew ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews, there's a parenthetical statement, for Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. In fact, in Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 6, where Jesus sends out the disciples to to offer the kingdom to Israel, he says these words, Matthew 10, verses 5 and 6, These twelve Jesus sent out after instructing them, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why not offer the kingdom to the Samaritans? Because the Samaritans were hated by the Jews. Luke 9, verses 51 through 56, talks about Jesus ministering. Early on in his ministry, he went to a Samaritan village. And the Samaritans would not receive the message of Christ. And so James and John, the sons of thunder, said this, Lord, do you not want us to call down heaven like Elijah did and destroy these people? So they had sort of a Rambo, uh, if you will, approach to ministry. We don't like the Samaritans anyway, Lord. We are bigoted against the Samaritans, and they haven't received the message of Christ. And so let's just wipe these people out, burn them up, uh, destroy them. And we even have examples of it, Lord, like Elijah did in the Old Testament. And so this all illustrates the ethnic hatred that was happening 
in the time of Christ between the, those in Jerusalem and those in Samaria. That's why the punchline of the story in Luke 10, verse 33, is designed to take your breath away. Because the good guy is the good what? Samaritan. Luke 10, verse 33 says, But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion on him. You've got to be kidding, Luke. Are you telling me that the hero of the whole story is one of these despised Samaritans? It's designed to take your breath away. In Acts chapter 8, verses 15 through 17, as the church age has begun, the Holy Spirit typically And the way it's normative for us is the moment we trust Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit in full. But that's not what happened in Samaria when the gospel finally made its way into Samaria. Acts 8, verses 15 through 17 says this, Who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. So in essence, what happened is the gospel finally made its way into Samaria, Acts chapter 8. Many Samaritans believed, but according to Acts 8, verses 15 through 17, they did not receive the Holy Spirit immediately. That is non-normative. That's not the way it's supposed to work. The way it's normative in the church age is you receive the Holy Spirit immediately at the point of faith. But here, God denied the Samaritans the Holy Spirit until the folks in Jerusalem could go and see that, yes, it's true. The Samaritans have become Christians, and the apostles at that point laid hands on the Samaritans, and they received the Holy Spirit. Why did God delay the giving of the Holy Spirit to the Christians in Samaria? Because the folks in Jerusalem needed to see for themselves that it was indeed true that a Samaritan can actually come to Christ. You see, the ethnic hatred between these groups was so powerful and it was so intense that a transitional issue had to occur whereby the Spirit of God had to be delayed so the people in Jerusalem could really understand and see that the grace of God is available to those in Samaria. Had that not occurred, you would have had two churches in early Acts. Those in Samaria would have just kept on doing their own thing and set up a rival system on Mount Gerizim. And God did not want two churches in the church age. He wanted Jerusalem to understand that they belonged to Samaria, and he wanted Samaria to understand that they belonged to Jerusalem. They are all one in Jesus Christ, and thus there was a temporary suspension of the Spirit's activity regarding what is normative or normal in the church age. All of these things you can't understand unless you understand the intense hatred and animosity that existed between the Jews and the Samaritans. And that's why when the Jews traveled from Judea to Galilee, according to the map I have here, they just skipped Samaria altogether. They probably reasoned that those people are beyond the reach of the grace of God. Why even bother with them? That kind of sounds like us a little bit, doesn't it? There are some people we think to ourselves that are so far gone. They are so dead in their trespasses and sins. They are so far in rebellion that they are beyond God's grace. They are beyond God's reach. I have to admit that something very scary rises up within my soul as I am driving to work and I pass through one of the largest abortion providers in the United States of America on the way, and I see these people on the sidewalks carrying their signs and saying over and over again and communicating that let's keep abortion legal. I have to admit that something very scary rises up inside of me where I say to the Lord, Lord, just let those people slide right into hell where they belong. They are so far gone in terms of understanding of Scripture, that they are unreachable. 
you see. And that is a carnal, wicked attitude that we can sometimes indulge. And yet that's how these Samaritans were looked at. Now, given that background, I want you to look very carefully at verse 4. John chapter 4 and verse 4. It says specifically, Jesus had, notice the word had, he had to pass through Samaria. In other words, Jesus did something totally abnormal. He did not go around Samaria to the east of the Jordan River, but he went right on through. And I could imagine the disciples complaining about this as he set the course. And why did he go right on through Samaria, a racial group that had been rejected by the Jews? A rebellious group of people who were syncretizing Judaism with Babylonian religion. A group of people that were half-breeds. A group of people that were so wicked they wouldn't even go to Jerusalem to worship God. Why would Jesus bother and take his trip, uh, which was abnormal, directly through Samaria? Answer, because Jesus loves the despised. We have to understand something about the character of God. He does not look at human beings as unreachable. He looks at people everywhere as if all people could be saved. Jesus' love is not just for the beautiful people. It's not just for the people who dot their I's and cross their T's. It is for people that are rebellious and doing everything they can against God. And what we discover is there is a woman who he is supposed to meet there in Samaria. And this woman, as we will discover, has three strikes against her. What are they? Number one, she's part of this group, this Samaritan group, this half-breed group, this rebellious group, this syncretizing group. The second strike against her is that she is a woman. Not only is she from the wrong race, but she is also from the wrong religion, and she is also of the wrong gender. Let me quote to you a famous rabbinical saying, and it was likely active during the time of Christ. It says, I give thanks that I was not born a goy. Now, goy means Gentile. I I, I, I give thanks that I was not born a Gentile. I was not born a woman. And I was not born a slave. The Mishnah says this. Women in Christ's day were not even permitted to be taught the scriptures. And yet, what is Jesus Christ doing with Mary and Martha sitting at his feet? He is violating all of the cultural taboos. And he's reaching out to two women, giving them a privilege that they could not dream of in first century Judaism. Again, the Ryrie Study Bible footnote says this, A woman of Samaria, for a man to speak in public to a woman who was a stranger, and for a Jew to converse with a Samaritan was most unusual. I think that's an understatement. It was not most unusual. This was a 100% rebellion by God against a cultural taboo at the time. This woman had two strikes against her. Number one, she's a Samaritan. And number two, she is a woman. One of the things that tests my sanctification to the breaking point is cable television. Because I watch all of these cable shows of people talking about political issues and people from the right and people from the left. And I hear people from the left saying constantly, We can't bring the Bible back into a place of prominence in America because the Bible promotes slavery. Or the Bible is anti-woman. And I say to myself, have they not read John chapter 4? I start yelling back at the television. I say, you're wrong. And my wife is in the other room, says, who are you screaming at? So I'm screaming at the television. And she says, well, that's a productive use of your time. Just go right ahead and do that. But all of this idea that the Bible is somehow promoting of racism and the Bible is somehow anti-woman could not be more uh, contradicted by the clear events here of John 
four. Jesus does not care about race. Jesus does not care about gender. Jesus cares about reaching the unreachable through the grace of God. In America today, Christianity has flourished. It is in decline to some extent, but there has never been a country in the world that has not been more permeated by Christianity than the United States of America. And I find it very interesting that in this country that Christianity has such a powerful influence over through the First Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening, the Ivy League institutions, and on and on we could go, documenting the Christian origins of America. It is very interesting to me that in this country that has been permeated with Christian thought that women enjoy the highest status of anywhere in the whole world. I wish these feminists would go to a nation controlled by Islam where Christianity has not penetrated and look at how women are treated in that culture. How a man has a right to legally rape his wife, how a man has a right to legally beat up his wife, how two witnesses in a court of law that are of the feminine gender must counterbalance a single witness in a court of law that comes from the masculine gender. The great lie of our day is that if the Bible comes back to a place of prominence in our culture, somehow racism will come back and somehow women will be subjugated. And may I just say that is about 180 degrees wrong in terms of thinking. And the people on these cable shows that continually make these criticisms have, in my opinion, never investigated the Bible that they're so quick to judge and so quick to criticize. You see, Christ came to this person who had three strikes against her. Number one, she's of the wrong race. Number two, she's of the wrong religion. Number three, she is a woman. And this ruins my three strikes analogy. Let's make it four strikes. The fourth strike against her is she was sexually immoral. Drop down to John 4, verses 17 and 18, and you'll see these words. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have answered correctly, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one that you are currently with, in other words, her current sexual partner, the one you are currently with is not your husband. So not only was this woman of the wrong race, of the wrong religion, of the wrong gender, but she was despised by the Jews because of her immorality. Matthew 21, verse 31 says this, When the two did the will of his father, they said, the first Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you that the tax collectors and the prostitutes will enter the kingdom of God before you. Notice that in Jewish thought, a tax collector and a prostitute were on the same level morally. A tax collector was the bottom of the bottom because the tax collector could collect money for Rome and then whatever else he wanted, he could steal from the Jewish people. A tax collector in this culture was considered a traitor because it was a Jew working for Rome and it was also considered a a thief. It would be like calling someone a pornographer or an abortionist or something of that nature in our society today. The tax collector was right at the bottom, and right along with the person at the bottom, the tax collector, was a prostitute. That's why when Jesus enters a conversation with this woman, the disciples themselves cannot believe what is happening. And Jesus came into the world to eradicate the bigotry and the prejudices of men. How does this work its way out in the church age? It works its way out this way in Galatians 3 verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. 
as the same Jesus who ministered to the woman at the well, works his way out in the church, we find the barriers that so quickly divided first century religious life and political life absolved. Those barriers disappear. There's neither Jew nor Greek. That's the elimination of racial hostility. There is neither slave nor free. That is the elimination of socioeconomic hostility. There is neither male nor female. That is the elimination of gender hostility. Now, I'm not talking about roles. We all play different roles in the church in marriage. I'm talking about worth this morning. All individuals in Christ have an equal value and worth. Why? Because they are made in the image of God. And if they are bought by the blood of the Lamb, they are all purchased equally. And that is the spirit through which Jesus Christ looks at this woman. In Ephesians 2, verses 14 and 15, it says this, For he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of the commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two, that's religious hostility between Jews and Gentiles, so that he might make the two into one new man, that's the church, thus establishing peace, peace which did not exist in the first century between those two groups. You see, the Bible is the greatest book on gender reconciliation and racial reconciliation that you can ever read. And yet, what direction is our culture heading in? What direction have we been moving in over the last 50 to 60 years? Man, in his fallen state, knows there's hostility between the races. And so man tries to fix the problem with a law. And the law, in many cases, cannot solve the problem because a law does not deal with the human heart. A man-made law cannot deal with a heart that is filled with hatred and anger, and must be changed by the power of the Spirit of God. So in the last 50 to 60 years, and I'm not saying these are bad things, they're well-intentioned, many of them, we've had legislation, we've had affirmative action, we've had timetables and quotas, we have had mandatory uh, busing, uh, busing one racial group in, in, into the neighborhood of another. And all of these have been done over and over again with the intent of eliminating or eradicating racial hatred in America. Heck, we have uh, spent $5 trillion in wealth transfer, transferring wealth from one group of people to another, all in the hope that the races will come together. And let me just say to you, how has that worked out for us? I would argue that America is more polarized over racial lines than she has ever been. In fact, we have a president who back in 2004 made this statement. He says, I don't, I'm not in favor of red states. I'm not in favor of blue states. I'm in favor of the United States. And everybody applauded. And we put this man into power for four years. And how has it really worked out for us? I would argue that after four years of this, America is more divided over race than she has ever been. And this is after trillions of dollars. This is after all of the legislation. This is after all of the mandatory busing. Look at this last election just as an example. This country is not united. This country is divided. And that election was about as close as it possibly could have been. Why have all of man's attempts to remedy racial hatred, why has it failed? Because man can only deal with things at a surface level. Things have to change at a heart level. And no human law or human governmental coercion can change that. Legislation cannot permanently fix the issue. The transformation of the human heart fixes the issue. And I am not a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I'm just going to make a prediction here. 
this afternoon. The further our society moves away from this book, it doesn't matter how many laws we pass. It doesn't matter how many programs we implement. The racial tension in this culture will continue to grow and grow and grow because this book and passages like John chapter 4 are the only passages which can fix the problem. The more the Bible is marginalized and kicked out of culture, the more the racial tension will continue to grow. The more we fail to understand the heart of God as given in John 4, the more the racial tension will continue to grow. I work at a Bible college, the College of Biblical Studies. Our primary population at that college is African American. And I walk into the classroom, and they're sort of looking at me like, oh my gosh, what's this guy going to say? Kind of like the way some of you look at me. And immediately despite all sorts of racial differences, I'm on the same page with them. Why is that? Because I'm teaching out of the Word of God. They love Jesus and are bought by His blood. I love Jesus and am bought by His blood. And there is a spiritual bond that is happening between us that no human law can remedy or fix or impose or implement. And what I want you to see this morning, this afternoon, is Jesus is doing something radical. He is doing something abnormal. He is doing something that transcends culture. He is going to minister to a woman who has three and four strikes against her in the eyes of man. But in the eyes of God, she is someone that can be reached. Notice, if you will, uh, verse 5. It says this, Now he came to the city of Samaria, called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. So he goes to Samaria, and there's a city there called Sychar. If your eyes are very good, you can actually see the city of Sychar there mentioned in this map. And he goes to uh, near a parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, Jacob received that ground in Genesis 33, verse 12, and he gave it to Joseph in Genesis 48 and verse 22. This is where the scene happens. And Jesus is very wearied and very tired from his journey. Look, if you will, at verse 6. So Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. How could God be tired? Because he wasn't just God. He was the monogenes, the only begotten, the unique God-man. He is the one who added humanity alongside eternally existing deity, humanity and deity together in one individual. And as a human being, he suffered from many of the limitations that we suffer from. Here in John chapter 4 and verse 6, we learn that he was weary and that he was tired. In uh, Matthew chapter 4 verse 2, he was hungry. In John 19, verse 28, he indicates that he was thirsty. In John 13, verse 21, his soul was troubled. He begins to weep in John 11 and verse 35. In Luke 19, verse 41, it says, When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it. So it is interesting to me that John brings out these features of Jesus Christ, revealing him to be the unique God-man. And as such, he is qualified to be our sympathetic and merciful high priest. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 says this, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who is tempted... In all things as we are, yet without sin. My short size gives me away, but I did used to, at one time in my life, play the game of basketball. I played basketball from the seventh grade all the way through college. And through those years, I had two kinds of coaches. I had coaches that never played. They never played in any formal way. 
And then I had other coaches that had played the game. And coaches have a tendency to want you to work harder, to push yourself, to go the extra mile, to lift weights more. And when those two coaches would utter their edicts at us, which type of coach do you think had my respect? I didn't have respect for the coach that had never gone through the discipline that I was going through. But the coach that had and had experienced exactly what I was experiencing in terms of pain, that's the coach that won my respect because he knew how I felt when I was being told to work harder, to lift more, to run more. And what you have to understand with the God-man, Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man, as he is in his present position at the Father's right hand as our merciful high priest, and we cry out to him in the midst of our limitations, you're dealing with somebody who has stood exactly in your shoes. He knows what it's like to experience hunger, thirst, pain, emotional trouble. Have you ever been betrayed by a friend? Someone close to you kind of sticks their knife in your back. That's a painful human experience. Yet Jesus experienced that very thing with Judas. Virtually any circumstance you may find yourself in today, Jesus has been where you are and he is available with help and grace during your time of need. He was wearied. You'll notice also it says it was the sixth hour. Have you ever been frustrated by time? Have you ever uh, been under a constant schedule of deadlines and no matter how hard you seem to work, you never can really catch up? Have you ever looked at your email and no matter how many times you try to answer all of the email, another round of email comes pouring through and there's just not enough hours in the day to fulfill all of the needs that people want us to fulfill? Jesus lived in those same circumstances. He was the God man. He was constrained by time. He understood the basic frustrations of living on a time schedule. And John, who is describing this God man, does such a wonderful job at bringing those things out. John 1 verse 39 talks about Jesus ministering during the 10th hour. John uh, chapter 4 and verse 52 mentions the seventh hour. John 19 and verse 14 mentions the sixth hour. Yes, you can go to Jesus Christ with your basic complaints about times and schedules and deadlines because he knows how to minister to you grace in your time of need because he has stood in our shoes and experienced the things that we have experienced yet without sin. He is the coach who has actually played the game. He understands what you feel, what you think, and he can give you grace and mercy having stood in your very shoes. It is interesting that it mentions here Jacob's well. Verse 6 says, so Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well, and it was the sixth hour. This well is not mentioned anywhere in the Old Testament that I am aware of, but there was a well there on that property that Jacob gave to Joseph. And this is all setting the stage for a predestined conversation that Jesus is about to have with a woman that society and Judaism had forgotten. Why does Jesus go to all of this trouble? We have to understand the mind of God. Jesus is ministering, as we will see in the following verses, to somebody that society had forgotten. Somebody who had three strikes against her, or four strikes against her, and yet the God-man reverses normal travel procedure to make an appointment with you. When Jesus died on that cross, he had this woman that society had forgotten in mind. And that's a natural segue into the gospel. Because when Jesus died on that cross, he had you in mind. And you may say to yourself, well, I'm unqualified to receive the grace of God. Welcome to the club. None of us are qualified. You may say to yourself, well, preacher, you don't know what has happened in my life. 
I mean, you don't know the things that I have done. You don't know the abuse that I have absorbed. And it's true. I don't know those things. But God knows those things. And he has set up an appointment with you. Just as he set up an appointment with this woman that society and religion and race and culture had forgotten. You may say to yourself, well, you don't understand the failures I've gone through in my life. I mean, I've tried this and it hasn't worked out, and I've tried that and it hasn't worked out. My marriage hasn't worked out. My kids are in a state of rebellion against me. Nothing has worked for me. Well, you also are not beyond reach of the grace of God. God's heart is to minister and to reach everyone, even those that have been written off by the church. There are many people, as I said before, that we have basically written off. The church won't minister to them. And yet Jesus has not forgotten them. He loves those that are unlovable. And so if that is your circumstance this morning, I would ask you in the quietness of your own heart, as the Spirit of God is convicting you and placing you under conviction, to respond to the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is simply this. Jesus has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Luke 19 and verse 10 says that. It doesn't matter if you see yourself as unqualified. The fact of the matter is the gospel message and its grace is available to you. Jesus Christ, the second member of the Trinity, stepped out of eternity into time to live a life in my place that I couldn't live. He stepped out of eternity into time to die a horrific death in my place and to pay a penalty that I could never pay. He validated and vindicated who he was through his bodily resurrection from the dead. He ascended and is now seated at the right hand of the Father as our sympathetic high priest. And he has left humanity with a basic promise. And that promise is this. If we will believe, which is a synonym for trust, it's a synonym for rely, it's a synonym for depend, it's a synonym for have confidence in, if we believe the promises of Jesus Christ, then we will enter one day eternity with him in heaven, and we have the gift of eternal life now, and we can have a relationship with him now. Becoming a Christian is not a 12-step program. Becoming a Christian is a one-step program. It's not about raising a hand. It's not about walking an aisle. It's not about joining a church. It's not about giving money to charitable causes. What it's about is simply fulfilling the one condition God has asked lost humanity to fulfill, which is to believe, or to trust, or to rely, or to depend upon. It's something you can do right there in the quietness of your own heart, in the quietness of your own thoughts, as the Spirit of God is placing you under conviction. Go ahead and respond the best you know how to do it to the message of the gospel and the message of the cross. Shift whatever confidence you had in some other thing to procure your eternity, whether it be your baptism certificate, your church membership, shift confidence away from those things and shift them exclusively and completely into the promises of Jesus Christ. And if that's something that you are doing, on the authority of God's word, you have passed from death into life. You have received forgiveness, grace, and the gift of eternal life. And the Holy Spirit is now inside of you. If it's something that you want more discussion on or more questions answered, I'm very much available after the service to talk. Next week we will re-pick up the story of the woman at the well. We've sort of set the table for it. And this woman is about to receive from Jesus Christ the theology lesson of her entire life. And he will develop for her Two contrasts. He will develop the contrast between liquid water, which has been set, the stage has been set for us because he's at the well, thirsty. Liquid water versus living water. 
verses 10 through 19, and then he will continue on in verses 20 through 27, and he will talk about worship, and he will develop the contrast of ritual worship versus real worship or authentic worship. Shall we pray? Father, we are grateful for this passage of Scripture. Thank you for helping us understand how it relates to us in the year 2012. Help us, Lord, as Christians and believers to see people the way you see them. Help us not to look at people as if they're somehow forgotten and beyond the grace and the reach of God. But let us look at people, Lord, that have long since forgot, been forgotten by society through the eyes of your grace and see them as souls for whom Christ died. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory in God's people said. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Minister to someone you don't know on the way out. God bless you. You're dismissed.